So the next thing that we want to make sure we're aware of is what works for you. So earlier I spoke about the importance of personalising the breathing, personalising the wellbeing tools. There's no point thinking, okay, well, yoga's great for my best friend. Why is it not working for me? Because maybe yoga's not for you. And so let's have a little look. Some people, there are two ways that you can manage your wellbeing. You can be a segmenter or an integrator. So there are people who like to segment the different aspects of their life and that's how they manage their well-being. So what I mean by that is they do not bring any work through the door into their house. Or if they do, the only place that the work can exist is in the study. So it can't be on the dining table where other things go on because that's the business of the family or whatever it is. If it's you living alone, that's where you sit down and you enjoy your meals and you have some time to rest and recover. So working out whether or not you're that kind of person. I have other people with whom I work, teachers who just at the end of the day, the first thing they do before they rest or do anything is they take their work clothes off and put something else on. So I'm a bit of a segmenter like that. I get home and I pick the kids up from school. I come home if I'm not presenting that night uh, because it'd be wrong to turn up in pyjamas. I get straight into my pyjamas. So I feel like four o'clock at night, but that's how I segment my day. That's how I Give myself that really obvious signal. I'm leaving all of that hard work I've put in all day, but I am now leaving it behind. I am now in rest mode. And we know this from so much literature that really around four o'clock is when our brain is really wanting us to rest. So we all know we tend to work a fair bit past that four o'clock mark. But even giving yourself a signal, so let's just say you do need to do some more work or say I'm writing, you're doing writing, email, marking, whatever you're doing. Even just by putting the PJs on or the trackies on or just wearing home clothes, it's a signal. It's something that says to the brain, okay, we're transitioning. We're doing something to slow down. So little ways that you can segment your life and go, well, this is work. Or for me, you know, I am so, I love the opportunity to be able to access a whole bunch of things on my mobile phone, right? And I'm being honest about this because I don't think we talk enough about just how addictive our devices are. I mean, they're just like right from the sparkly cover that I've got, I like looking at it. It's easy to use, you press a swipe. We all know, we've read that, heard about that research where you do a very similar move to you do at the, you know, in gambling. It's, it's an addictive thing, right? And so for me, what I do, because I do not want to be in, on my phone around our children, I do not want to be on my phone at the kitchen table or at the dining table, I just really need to leave it behind because even if it starts with something really fun like sending a text to a friend um, or, or checking the social media or reading a really interesting article, that's where it starts. It's not where it ends, is it, folks? So the reality is, is it then leads into a whole bunch of other things and suddenly you've spent an hour on your phone. So the way I segment that, so for example, when I go to the gym in the morning, I take my phone with me. I then leave the phone in my car, right? And I do not take it in. So I finish at the gym in time for when the family wakes up so that we can, yeah, all reconnect. So I come in and then all the kids are waking up and um, we're all getting ready for our day. My phone, I've segmented that, is in my car, which means if I really need, like if the kids are like, oh, mum, you need to sign this bit of paperwork or, you know, all the other things that we do, um, I will then go back and, and I will fill out that online form um, after that. But it's got to be a really good reason. Whereas if you're like me, if that thing is, like if the phone's in front of you and you're just walking past, like I'm just walking by, I just might just check. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm checking some of the time, but it's there and that's how they're designed, right? Because it's really so much of our community, our friends are, are on that phone. So that's how I segment that. Then again, I don't want to have it after hours either. So I will take it to the car and I will put it in the car because who wants to go out to the car and go and collect the phone? Um, I don't take it into the bedroom. So using an old school alarm, is a really beneficial way to help you sleep better. There's research that tells us a device in the bedroom doesn't segment being alert, being engaged, 
being involved enough. So that's another way you can be a segmenter. And, and that's a really important uh, thing to keep in mind is how you manage your device use. Now, I've talked about that a fair bit because I think it's just really hard. And look, if you find it really relaxing to scroll and do that, by all means, you can use that as, as something that you do. It's more so what I'm talking about is when it becomes a distraction, when you're in your inbox and then you know about everything that you've got to do or you're just reminded, oh, I forgot to do that and suddenly you've lost your well-being time. You're now checking email, helping someone out, doing another thing and not resting. Now, some people are integrators, they can make it work. So if that's you, that's okay too. So some people are just like, oh, I've got a bit of everything on the go all the time, but it kind of feels good. So just tune in, how does your body feel? What's your body telling you about what you're doing? Because if you're getting a sick feeling in your tummy, if you're feeling tense, this is actually how I choose what I will and won't do actually. When I get asked, um, you know, invited to do something or, you know, to take something on, I actually tune into myself. And if it feels great uh, and, and it does involve, you know, a little bit of inconvenience or whatever, I will go, all right, but this feels great. I'm gonna make this work. I'm gonna find a way to make this work. But if it gives me that sinking feeling of how am I going to do this, how am I going to fit that in, I think, okay, this isn't for now. And that's how you do it, folks. That's how you look after your well-being. You make sure you're really, really aware and in tune with yourself. And so keep those things in mind. So let's keep on going. Uh, we're looking now at our thoughts. Our thoughts are everything. I mean, oh my goodness, the automaticity that our thinking happens at. They're just in there all the time. So drawing conscious attention to what you think about all day long. And for most people, it's the mental load. It's, you know, who am I picking up at what time? Where do I need to be? Oh my goodness, this student needs this, this family needs that, I need this. Um, oh, did I remember to hang up the washing? Now back to what's happening in front of me. And on and on it goes. Now, because thoughts come with automaticity, you can't just go, oh, that's it, I'm just not going to think about that anymore. It'll come back. So when it comes back, you acknowledge those thoughts and go, oh, here I am thinking about whether or not I've hung up the washing. Well, there's nothing I can do about that right now. So I'm going to bring myself back into the present moment. But really what I'm talking about, presence, of course, is a crucial well-being tool. Um, being able to just be in the moment, it's the only thing you have, right, for sure, is like right now. Uh, and that's important for our well-being. But when these thoughts come in, just pay attention to how they're making you feel because our thoughts create an emotion and from that emotion, we will behave accordingly. So our behavior will match our thoughts and feelings. So becoming consciously aware of our thoughts is crucial for really supporting our mental health and well-being. And one of the things that I think is really hard is in a job like education, you have all of this stuff that requires so much problem solving. So there's like often a lot of problems, right? And so because our brains are designed to look out for problems, uh, you know, we all have a negative bias, whether we're the most optimistic person on earth or not, we're programmed to look out for problems. So a little remnant of our cave times where, you know, there was saber toothed tigers walking around and clearly like we needed to be on the alert for danger. But of course, the amygdala, that part of the brain is still there. And so what that means is we naturally start to look at oh, well, what went wrong? Or one thing goes wrong, and then our mind is stuck on that one thing. So we can have an amazing day, a day where 95% goes well, but then there's that 5% that went wrong. So it could, have been, it could have been three minutes with a student where they were really losing it, and you didn't know what to do because you can't know what to do all the time. And you're in that moment and you're feeling really overwhelmed and you're feeling really stressed. And then it feels so all consuming because you weren't able to regulate and because you care for this kid and you care for yourself. And it is really an overwhelming feeling, isn't it? When you don't know what to do um, in those moments of work, that can then feel like you had a really bad day, right? Or maybe your class was a bit, you know, 
off for, for 30 minutes, but then there might have been six hours that they were actually really engaged and lovely to teach. So what we focus our mind on will create an emotion. And by nature of our negativity bias, that natural inclination to focus on the problems of our life, rather than focusing on what is going well, what will then happen is the brain will neurologically wire for thinking about problems. <laughs> And so we know when we think about those beautiful 86 billion neurons, we don't want their dominant wiring to be around the stuff that's wrong in our lives. You know, I heard a great thing. I wish I could remember the source, but I can't at the moment. They were talking about poverty. And, you know, we've all seen it, right? We, we've seen those images where families are living in really difficult conditions and everyone's happy. Right. If, if you've travelled and you've been in an environment and you see that they don't, you know, food is scarce, hygiene is scarce, clean water is scarce, health is, is not, look, we live in this beautiful, we're watching this from in Australia, you know, we live in this gorgeous country where we have access to so much, you know, it's such a beautiful place to live. Now, there are so many parts of the world where, yeah, there are people with no shelter, no, not enough food, not enough education, not enough money, but laughing and smiling, right? And so I was reading, you know, about what, what this is, and it's lots and lots of things. And, you know, one of the, the comments was like, like, look, being poor is really awful. It's really, really hard, but being poor together kind of makes it better. Right, kind of makes it bearable. And really what that message is about is they're all in this thing together and we are too, right, in education. We're all in this together. We're there to support and be connected with each other and to have our people. But if we don't have it all, right, if we don't have enough moments in our day where we can just be in silence, because we're surrounded by students all day, like all day you're around people, you don't get a break. So you might not have that, but if you then focus your attention on what you do have, so it's the same thing for the people in those really difficult circumstances when you speak with them, when you talk to them, they had this joy based on their friendships, their connections, the tiny little bit of food they all just shared or the fact that someone walked past and gave them something. And they just get, take this enormous delight and then they think about that. So their bias, that optimism, and optimism is a learnt thing, it's a learnt skill, right? That grateful thinking pattern changes what we're thinking about. So if we consciously go, you know what, Yes, I have problems all day um, and my job is really, really hard. But if we actively seek out to start thinking about all the things that went well, we start neurologically wiring our brains for optimism and, and gratitude. And we know the literature tells us 21 days of gratitude practice. So investing 21 days, and you can't just do this, this right? you can't do this, right? This won't work. You can't go, um, okay, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to have shelter. I'm grateful to have food. And then you move on to the next day and you go, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to have food. I'm grateful to have shelter. I think that was the same three. Basically, my point is this. You can't repeat the same thing for 21 days. <laughs> when I run this in schools, you know, quite often, the, particularly with kids, less so with adults, they'll just focus on the same things and really quickly write it down in their gratitude journal. The literature reminds us across that 21 day period, it needs to be three new things every day. So whatever 21 times three is, I should be able to work that out, but I can't. 63? <laughs> you can have that, you can laugh at my expense. Anyway, but for 21 days, if we do that and have three new things, we've got all this abundance of what is going right. And with that abundance of what goes right, our brains start to go, actually, I've got a great life. Actually, my life is good. I, I, and then you start building this beautiful, abundant mindset instead of this deficit mindset. And a deficit mindset is going to make your well-being feel like this. 
an abundant mindset is going to be like, my gosh, I feel well. I feel mentally clear. My state of mind's good. I've got stuff to look forward to. I've got stuff to reflect back on. Gee, I love my life. And that's a state of wellness when you are directly focusing. I think, you know, in terms of problems, I think, I think we've all got them, right? And, you know, it's really nice when you're in a winning season, but life takes seasons of life. <laughs> seasons, right? So there's times when everything's great. Um, it's, smart, it's, you know, it's going nice and smooth. And then like eight seconds later, something happens and it's really, really hard. So I think we're all going through it at different stages of our life, different uh, ages. You know, we'll, we'll be juggling more or less. Uh, and so if we just go, you know what, either way, every day, I'm going to draw my thoughts. I'm going to bring in thoughts. I'm going to focus my thinking on what's working and what I'm glad I have rather than what I don't have. And from that 21 day research, we know you can take a low level pessimist and turn them into a low level optimist in that 21 day period by doing that. So we know the global literature is telling us, let's just go back to the basics, folks. Let's breathe better. Let's focus on what we do have rather than we do what we don't have. And then some of the methods that we'll continue to focus on. So that's what I'd like to share with you about thinking. Look at the quality of your thoughts. Keep the quality of them in the forefront of your mind and keep bringing in what you can. When the negative one comes, don't be hard on yourself. They ha it happens to all of us. Just go, oh, I can feel that in my body. I'm thinking really negatively. I'm feeling really pessimistic. I am not going to put my attention on that. I'm going to focus it on something else.